What do you think is happening in the blockchain industry right now? I think in the long run, DeFi wins. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. The best case for consumers at the moment, it's really sad to say, is, uh, is pulling back on consumption, conserving. They're doing it because high prices tend to do that. But uh, there's no way that there can be a replacement of the Seven day losing streak on the Nasdaq Composite. It has been brutal over the last week. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. Looking for a bounce and getting a drop. We're down two tenths on the S&P. The countdown to be open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with a big issue. Dollar dominance. The strength of the dollar. The strong dollar. Unrelenting U.S. dollar strength. What it really tells you is that it reflects the strength of the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy is faring better than the rest of the world. Compared to Europe, compared to emerging markets, compared to China. Currency is a big, you know, element here. The dollar is particularly strong. At some point in the first quarter of 2023, that U.S. dollar is going to peak. Valuation is pretty stretched. And when that happens and the U.S. dollar weakens, I think it could turn quite quickly. It's creating ripple effects across assets. But in the, in the short term, and again into Q4 particularly, Europe is in big trouble. The recession in Europe and the energy crisis that is brewing. Europe and the U.K. is so utterly um, pernicious. So no win. I think the strong dollar is here to stay over the near term. The dollar is going to be king for a good few months. It's the king right now, that's for sure. Joining us now is BlackRock's Gargi Chowdhury and TPW's Jay Koloski. Gargi, let's start there. Is it too early to fade this dollar strength story? Good morning, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Um, it might be a bit too early. I think we're still going to see some more weakness, especially out of Europe, given the net grass and energy crisis that's ongoing. That's obviously around the dollar story. It's not about rates. It's not about what the different central banks are doing. It's all about that safe haven. And on a year like this, when we haven't had positive performance in either equities or bonds, the dollar has been the best hedge. Um, I think the end is near, though. I don't know whether it's this month or the next month. I do think the end is near. So for those investors that have been waiting on the sidelines to perhaps go into, for example, local currency EM debt, I do think we're about to get there, but uh, perhaps a little too too early as we continue to get some poor data and uh, more uh, sort of uh, unfortunate news in, in terms of energy out of Europe. Okay, okay, the timing is questionable. Let's talk about the reason. What's the catalyst? Why do you think the end is near? Um, well, number one, we've obviously seen this huge move already. The whole reason, or one of the big reasons for this move, was this idea that U.S. would be the best among some of the other DM economies that are obviously slowing down. So perhaps part of that has begun to get priced in. So part of that is just the pricing in. Was this the, uh, you know, thinking back to January of this year, this is exactly what we would have expected would happen if the U.S. was doing better than perhaps, perhaps Europe, uh, the U.K., etc. So part of that is pricing. Another reason, I think, is that by the end of this year, we will see the Fed having done most of, or at least my view is, that they'll have done most of the hiking that they're supposed to do. We've already priced, uh, fully priced for them to go about 75 for this meeting, 50, and then a 25. Um, I think that's the end of that cycle. I doubt that they're going to go much higher than that. And that's another reason why we could see a stabilization in the U.S. dollar. The dollar right now, very close to 111 on the dollar index. Jordan Rochester over at Nomura making some headlines in the last week with some big, big calls on the euro and on sterling. He says this, the problem started in energy. It will end there. Everything else is pretty much noise for now. Expect euro dollar at 90 cents by year end, sterling at 106 by year end. Euro dollar right now, 98.87, cable 114.28. Jay, you are the perfect guest to talk about this with, Europe. <laughs> you think peak fear in terms of the European energy story is here. Is that it then for the euro story, for the sterling weakness we've seen over the last year? Well, I don't know about that, Sterling, John, uh, because I think what we're seeing here is uh, the downside of Brexit and the UK decision to go it alone. This is not a crisis where you want to be alone. Uh, clearly, the EU is going to attack this from a regional basis, from an um, integration basis. It's too big for any one country. So uh, no, no strong feelings on Sterling. They're on their own. Good luck. Uh, on the euro, uh, yes, I think we've already passed peak fear. John, we had Russia shut the Nord Stream 1 uh, pipeline. They shut it. And what happened? Gas prices fell. They're off 35 percent from the high. We're done with uh, the European uh, gas crisis. And I do think that uh, that means that the euro is going to strengthen from here. Um, you are going to see the ECB raise probably 75 basis points. They're going to be raising rates more in 2023 than uh, the Fed is, and that's going to provide uh, strength for the euro. I think buying the euro here is, uh, if you have a six to 12 month view, is, uh, is a pretty attractive option. Trade for the brave right now for some people. Jay, let's unpack some of that. I'll get to the ECB call in just a moment. You think we're done on the energy side. Some people might say, Jay, well, we haven't seen the blackouts yet. We expect we will. Other people might say, we're waiting for industry shutdowns in places like Germany through the winter. This could get a whole lot worse. But why do you think that might not be the case? 
because I think the markets are forward looking. We've already thought about all that stuff. We've already discounted all of that. The biggest fear, the number one fear was that Russia would shut off the gas. Now, thankfully, in a way, uh, they've done it. And so we have faced the fear. And guess what? It's not all that horrible. G uh, gas prices are going down, not up. If there was such a shortage of gas, John, even in the outlets, and by the way, the, the forward contracts have, have not uh, gone up uh, as a result of uh, the Russian shut-in either. So if there was a big fear of gas shortages coming uh, over time, it would be uh, manifested. And I don't think that's going to be the case. Instead, what we're seeing actually is Europe coming together again in a crisis. We're going to see the energy ministers meet on the 9th. They're going to come up with the EUI plan. They're going to cover this situation, and they're going to emerge stronger from it. Um, I continue to be impressed by how Europe is dealing with the situation, uh, you know, again, virtually against all other opinion. And to me, this is really a signal that Europe is going to get its energy uh, system in place. It's going to be out of the Russian uh, uh, clutches, and it's going to be a clean energy leader that uh, is going to uh, have a great opportunity to surprise people to the upside in the coming years. I'm, I'm continuing to be strategically on a one, three, five-year basis. I think Europe is extremely attractive. 28 straight weeks of equity fund outflows. 12-month forward PE of 11 and a half times versus 17 for the U.S. Earnings upgrades, John. More earnings upgrades in Europe than downgrades currently um, going forward for the rest of this year. There's a lot that is, um, you know, relatively positive. If you like, um, you know, markets that other people hate, if you like cheap markets, if you like things that are on a turn, I think we're about to see the peak of the dollar. Uh, the Fed uh, cut, uh, raising rates 75 basis points next week. That's going to be it for the front loading. That's going to mark the dollar peak, and that's going to set off all sorts of uh, asset allocation changes. Okay, okay, I'm sure you're listening to this and itching to get in, so please jump in. My question to you yeah. would be, is it too early to look ahead to spring before we've even had winter in Europe. <laughs> so the one thing that I'd make, and obviously, uh, you know, there are some good points made around we have already seen the shutdown of Nord Stream, and perhaps that was the biggest concern. But what we haven't seen so far is the severity of winter. And obviously, we all hope that it's going to turn out to be a pretty normal winter and the demand for energy will not be, you know, 15, 20 percent above normal. But we just don't know. And we won't know that for some time, which is why I still think that obviously there's going to be a point at which, uh, you know, to the other guest point, there's going to be a peak in the dollar. And perhaps you do want to get back into the euro. I just don't think that's yet. I mean, today we got the GDP print and we're still, I mean, obviously, we know that's backward looking. We're still looking at very solid consumption out of European uh, consum consumers. That's obviously not going to be the case as we look at data out for this quarter and the next. Um, so that's my, I, I hope that it doesn't turn out to be this way. But unfortunately, it's still too early, especially on the weather front, which is obviously going to be a big driver on the demand for energy. Futures right now down about a tenth of one percent. The big story over the last couple of days, the dollar dominance, euro dollar 98.89. We're down about a tenth of one percent on that currency pair. Sterling, 114.21. Taking a look at it, it's Taylor Riggs. Hi, Taylor. Hey, John. And not only looking across currencies, but the correlation with real rates as well. I think really surprising. We are firmly out of sort of the negative territory and looking at some big uh, real yields that are rising 84 basis points or so here on the 10-year real yield, along with sort of that dollar strength that you've been talking really all morning about. I think the interesting cross-asset correlation continues to be then what happens within the equity markets. At the top, you mentioned NASDAQ now looking at seven straight days of declines. Well, global equities are down now for about nine straight days. That is the longest streak going back in about 11 years. You're really starting to see at least global equities roll over just a little bit as we think about some of that dollar strength underway. Finally, the uh, further cross-asset correlations may be no surprise here, given that more traditional correlation that you see with dollar strength. You get commodities rolling over. Really, that chart shows it uh, when we think about the last two weeks. Okay. Taylor, thank you. Okay, I want to come to you on some comments from Tom Barkett over the Richmond Fed and the FT. He said the destination and real rates in positive territory and my intent would be to maintain them there until we're convinced that we've put inflation to bed. Gargi, you see opportunities in EM and I just wonder how uncomfortable the real rate story and how determined this Fed is to keep them there. How uncomfortable that makes you? Yeah, so we've definitely, you know, we heard a very strong and clear message from Chair Powell in the end of August at the Jackson Hole. They're telling us that they really want to push back on any rate cuts in 2023. Fine, the market obviously repriced immediately. And what they're telling us, and it's not just obviously Powell, it's every other speaker that's spoken since then. They've united to tell us that rates are going to be higher for longer. But what that means to me, though, this higher for longer story, is that it's a good time to own carry. So if you are higher, if you reset, the market's already priced that. So we're obviously already pricing in close to 3.8% on the Fed funds rate. Uh, perhaps it goes a little bit higher than that. I don't think so. But even if we price in about close to 4%, and then if we stay there, I think that's a Fed telling you to own carry. And one of the highest conviction trades I have going into now to the end of the year is actually the front end of high quality credit. So looking at IGSB, which really gives you access to investment grade credit in the front end of the curve, earning close to 5%, that's the yield of dreams. The yield of dreams. Jake, you agree? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one to top that. How about Asian high yield, um, which yields 9% in dollars and pays monthly? Uh, that's uh, one of our favorites. We have many that we like. Uh, we like uh, the uh, pipelines AMLT, which has a yield of about 7% and gives you exposure to the energy side as well. But I just want to pick up on, on the point about um, uh, opportunities in fixed income and uh, particularly in emerging markets. We're, we're actually quite getting more bullish on emerging markets in this environment. John, as you know, we talked about it. We have a view of a high nominal growth world supported by a global CapEx boom to deal with the three C's of COVID, climate, and conflict. And we think emerging markets are going to be a big winner in that. And it's interesting to note, I just took a look before getting on the air here, over the last month, EM has been a pretty significant 
significant outperformer with the S&P down, as we know, about 5 6 percent. Um, Acqui XUS down about 6 or 7 percent. EM broadly down 4. Um, Brazil is flat. Uh, Asian, uh, Southeast Asia down 2 percent. And the best performing fixed income instrument we've had over the last month is that Asian high yield ETF I mentioned. Uh, 30 percent uh, China property, John. You read the headlines, you wouldn't touch China property with a 10-foot bull. Last month was the best month for China high yield in a decade best performance in a decade. So there's a tremendous gap between what you read and what the markets are doing in many instances. And we always like to let Mr. Market tell us uh, rather than us try to tell Mr. Market. And Jay Pulaski, we talk more about Mr. Market in just a moment. Gargi Chowdhury alongside us as well. Jay Pulaski, so constructive on the major issues that everyone else is very, very bearish about. I can tell you on cruise right now, drop below 85 for the first time since January on WTI. Futures right now on the S&P down about two tenths of 1%. Yields a little bit lower as well with some movers. Here's Abby. John, let's start out with the stock that's moving in the opposite direction of futures and perhaps we'll turn uh, the markets around. Maybe, of course, I'm talking about Apple, the big heavyweight to each of the indexes. This on their big product unveil day up about two tenths of one percent. It will be interesting to see how this stock trades. Typically, it does climb on the day when the new iPhone is uh, revealed. And of course, there is a price hike expected. Pinterest up 4.1 percent, upgraded over at Wolf to outperform on improving fundamentals and positive catalysts despite an uncertain economy. United Airlines unchanged right now. They, of course, in a filing lifted their sales and margin outlook. Uh, demand is stronger than expected. Separately, they are threatening JFK uh, if regulators fail to expand, allow them to expand their schedule. And then finally, John Peloton down 1.7 percent. This on another filing around the company updating uh, the uh, warnings, the treadmill, uh, tread plus uh, unfortunate child death. Uh, and the consumer agencies uh, saying that they gave insufficient warnings that perhaps there's going to be some sort of financial responsibility there, John. Abby, thank you. A story, no doubt, we'll look at it again through the Dan Bloomberg TV and radio. Coming up, the EU considering radical measures to curb soaring energy prices. We are now confronted with astronomic electricity prices for households and companies and with an enormous market volatility. Therefore, we will put forward a set of five different immediate measures. That conversation, up next. What do you think is the future of the U.S. dollar? For the next 50 years, you are absolutely going to see a monetary revolution. But what you're going to see in the short to medium term is the strongest fiat currencies will hold on for much longer than we probably admit. We are facing an extraordinary situation, not only because Russia is an unreliable supplier, as we have witnessed over the last days, weeks, months, but also because Russia is actively manipulating the gas market. We will propose a price cap on Russian gas. Here, the objective is we must cut Russia's revenues, which Putin uses to finance this atrocious war in Ukraine. The EU unveiling emergency measures to ease soaring energy prices, including a price cap on non-gas power and on Russian gas. This after President Putin threatens to withhold oil and gas to any nation capping Russian commodities. Team coverage starts right now with Will Kennedy and Javier Blas out of London. Will, first to you, sir. Can you walk me through the separate plans, what we're hearing from the UK and what you've heard from the Europeans? So there's a five-point plan for the European Union, which is going to be discussed at the meeting of energy ministers on Friday. Uh, it includes several measures, I think notably a price cap on power that's generated from non-gas sources, so nuclear, renewables, hydropower, at 200 megawatts uh, an hour. Obviously, that's still quite a high price by power for con uh, by historical standards, but a lot lower than some of the prices we've seen. Um, also, stronger mandates on demand reduction uh, and uh, a possible levy on fossil fuel companies. Two other aspects which are interesting. Uh, first, liquidity support for the market. Now, I think that's important because it, if it's strong, it may stop some of these uh, very volatile me moves we've seen in um, gas and power in Europe um, if people have confidence that governments are standing behind uh, players in the market and it may help smooth out some of the volatility and finally there's a cap on Russian gas now that ultimately looks like the most headline grabbing part of the package but may prove to be one of the less significant parts because uh, as someone else pointed out earlier today only nine percent of Europe's gas is now coming from Russia after the Nord Stream pipeline was shut down that's an amazing drop-off from where it was before Javier one thing you've written about on Bloomberg opinion repeatedly is curtailing demand demand destruction and rationing where's that in all of this Javier well, the European Union is putting a plan that it will mandate a 10 to 15 percent uh, reduction in electricity demand across the, the, the continent. It's very unclear how that's going to happen. Certainly, with the measures that the European Union is announcing, the market is not going to longer be rationing the, the demand, and governments are going to have to do it. So mandates are going to have to be imposed. And I suppose that governments, at the end of the day, the big consumer of electricity in Europe everywhere is the industrial sector. Uh, governments will have to tell industries when and, and what they can produce. Uh, that is going to be a, a quite an interesting experiment to watch from outside. But that's where we are heading at the moment, because this plan of the European Union does not work unless you bring demand down. I'll be a blast alongside Will Kennedy to the both of you. Thank you. Just looking at crude drop away by 3% on Brent crude right now at 89.95. It's a break of 90 for the first time since February. A little bit earlier this morning, a break of 85 on WTI. Got that right now at 83.85. We're down 3.5% there. Final comment now from Gaga Chowdhury, Jay Poloski. Jay, you're very constructive on the European story. I'm slightly more concerned about transferring risk to the sovereign with unlimited liability in places like the UK. You were very keen to separate the UK from Europe. Just in a couple of words, can you tell me, Jay, why you think the pain might be more acute in the United Kingdom as compared to the rest of the European continent? Well, because they don't have the ability to uh, come together and act collectively, as um, Ursula van der Leyen just did. I mean, John, here's the deal. The, um, after COVID and now with the end crisis, 
the EU front and center in Europe acting collectively. And then the euro is an expression of that. And therefore, seeing that action, two big deals, Europe is going to be transformed by this. And the euro is that expression. You can buy it at 99 cents on the dollar. It's a pretty attractive deal to me. On the UK front, it's by itself. It's going to struggle to deal with all these issues. Uh, it's in a place with very few friends. And therefore, it's going to be more of a challenge and more difficult to see it work. When, when price, when you ration demand, as Europe is going to do and is already doing, uh, demand is falling uh, rapidly in yeah. many parts of the continent, you're going to get a significant price shock. And most of what they're proposing probably isn't even going to have to be used, in my opinion. Okay, okay, a final word from you, a few final words. Can these central banks, the ECB and the Bank of England, keep hiking into this? Um, honestly, it's going to be very difficult to realize what's been priced in in the markets, especially for the ECB. So when we're looking at a peak rate of over 2%, I just don't see how they get there. Obviously, they're going to go 75 tomorrow, and they're probably going to get to one and a quarter very quickly. But they're going to have to do this at the same time that they see the data really weakening in a meaningful manner and people suffering on the streets. Um, I think it's going to be very hard for them to get much above that one and a quarter to one and a half percent. So not likely to realize uh, what is currently in the price in the market, especially for Europe. Kaki Chantry, Jay Peloski, to the two of you. Thank you. Jay, so constructive. You wanted a bull. There's a bull. Coming up, the Monaco and later. Wells Fargo's Chris Harvey expecting stocks to move higher into year end. Another more constructive view around the opening bell coming up. Four minutes away from the opening bell. Futures down by about a tenth of one percent on the S&P. Here are your morning calls. First up, Wolf Research upgrading Pinterest to outperform, seeing significant long-term upside to both user growth and monetization. And Ken Partners downgrading Electronic Arts to neutral, expecting shares to be range-bound with limited capitalists on the horizon. And finally, Macquarie upgrading Netflix to neutral, 2.30 price target, highlighting the company's strengthening ad sales projections. Coming up, Wells Fargo's Chris Harvey expecting stocks to move higher as investors shift back into growth. That conversation up next, the opening bell, just around the corner. Four seconds away from the up and about this morning. Good morning to you all. This is the state of play right now. This Wednesday morning, futures down about a tenth of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up by two tenths of one percent on the Russell, down by about two tenths of one percent. We're kind of going nowhere. Bit of a churn after seven days of losses on the Nasdaq Composite. As the up and about switch to the board to get to the bond market, it's kind of like yesterday upside down. Yields are lower this time by five basis points to break the 3.30 again. 3.29.58. Euro dollar unchanged at about 99 cents. Sterling anything but unchanged. 1.14.32. Lower the session. 1.14.14 on cable. Right now down about eight tenths of one percent on the pound against the US dollar. Crude breaking down as well. We're down four percent here. $83 and about 50 cents on WTI. That's a cross asset price action with your movers at the open. Here's Abby. John, let's start out with a big tech mover. And of course, I'm talking about Apple on their big product reveal day. That iPhone 14 will be coming out. And the stock right now up modestly up about two tenths of 1%. United Airlines popping higher up about seven tenths of 1% in a filing. They did raise uh, guidance for both sales and margin outlooks. Demand is strong there. And of course, uh, earlier you were talking about how crude oil, WTI, broke below 85 for the first time since January. We have uh, Brent crude below 90 on this. The energy complex is weaker, one of the worst sectors on the day. And interestingly, I don't know if we can pull up Tesla, but we do have a headline from Tesla that Elon Musk's request to push the Twitter trial back. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not hugely surprising. The judge had said to both parties originally, look, go away and, and decide amongst yourselves which date you want to start the trial. Twitter had wanted to start earlier than October. Musk had originally pushed for next year, January or February. The date that they were targeting was October 17th. What Musk's team then said is they wanted to delay to December because they felt that Twitter were not forthcoming with specific information. In fact, the accusation from Musk's team was that Twitter was deliberately sitting on certain information and therefore that Musk's team felt they couldn't possibly be ready for an October trial. In the end, this is the news. It's been set. It's been denied. I, sorry, uh, his request to delay until December. So we're moving towards an October date and I hope to be there in Delaware. Talk to me about the relevance of this headline, then I just build on this for us. He's allowed to use the Twitter whistleblower complaint in the trial. How important is that? Yeah, so the whistleblower complaint, as Musk's team hoped to use it, was that this employee had knowledge or concerns about spam and bots on the platform. What Twitter's team told a court in the pre-trial hearing yesterday was that at the time of his employment, this employee never mentioned these issues to management while he was an employee. They said it was strange that the whistleblower would come out after the fact in the run-up to the hearing. So this is the crux of Musk's concern about his hesitancy to go through with his original $54.20 a share offer to buy Twitter, that the level of bots on the platform is not what he believed at the time he put in the bid. But Twitter have maintained all along that the level of bots is around 5% of all users They've used that in boilerplate regulatory filing language for a long time. It will be an interesting point of discussion during the trial. And we've got to talk about Apple as well. New iPhone a little bit later. Sure. Slightly earlier, I'm told, Ed. What are you looking for? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's often the worst kept secret in technology, isn't it? Investors go into this event knowing basically what the lineup is, the iPhone 14 next generation. You look over history over the last decade on seven occasions where Apple have released a new handset, the shares have gone down. There's nothing really to boost the stock here. What's really important for the street is the emphasis on higher price point, pro models. Why? Because you look at that chart on your screen, the Bloomberg terminal, sales growth in the fiscal first quarter, the December quarter, which is the key Christmas period, set to grow by just 1% year on year. So the street hopes that this higher price point with the pro models boosts that ASP average selling price and means that EPS growth will outpace that top line growth. But 
really interesting. You know I'm a complete nerd for this stuff, John. We want the emphasis on the, the, the higher capability camera. We want to know if this is a tease from Apple. Go on Apple's Twitter and look at the logo for this event, the far out event. It's the Apple logo is a constellation of stars. And the inference we've taken from that is that we could see new satellite capabilities. Do you remember when you and I used to talk about the 5G super cycle? Sure. Now we're going to be talking about satellites. So if, this is, uh, if I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere with no signal, that I can still get signal. Exactly. Is that right? Okay. Exactly. Ed, Kelly and I this morning were talking about the iPhone slowing down when the new iPhone comes out. Is there anything to that? Yeah, I think that there's a risk with this, right, this, this higher price point strategy. The street cheers it if it can boost EPS growth, but it comes at a time where the global economy is suffering. You know, Apple has shown some resilience with the changing macro picture because it's relied on middle and higher income markets to boost sales. But inflation such as it is and consumer hesitancy such as it is around the world, there is no guarantee that those consumers will stay through the end of the year as they have done in the first half of this year. Ed, thank you. I think you dodged a question there, but we appreciate it. You talked about something else. Sure. Look, Katie, you know what I'm talking about. I where's, do. where's the poll on Twitter? Where are we? More than 600 votes. 75% of people say, yeah, my phone slows down when the new there one we comes go. out. So. Let's see if this slows down a little bit <laughs> Uh, Kelly, I wanted to talk about Echo Sold and Ned Davis. This is what he wrote this morning. With sentiment of extremes between retail and institutional investors, it leaves the market vulnerable to a pullback and a retest at the lows. That division between the bulls and bears is going nowhere. Yeah, and usually we talk about the division on Wall Street itself, but there's also a noteworthy division between Wall Street and Main Street in that retail investors seem to be a lot more bullish than institutional investors are. What Ned Davis took a look at really is just short positions. The gap between the amount of net short contracts between retail and speculators is about 78,500. That is the widest going back to the April to June period of 2020, which noteworthy was not a bad time for stocks. It was right after the COVID market bottom. And historically, the S&P has rallied sharply when large speculators have been heavily short as they are now but on the flip side the speed in which retail optimism has picked up Ned Davis says usually means that stock market returns are flat when you get this optimistic this quickly and as for the street itself obviously as we were just looking at there as the S&P 500 has dropped 18 percent this year those targets have come down from 49.50 uh, the average target at the end of last year to 43.76 as of August. But the pain hasn't necessarily been con concentrated in the S&P 500 alone. It's much more in large cap technology, which is why the Nasdaq 100 is down 8.5% over the last month. The S&P growth index down about 7.5%. And what do those two indexes contain, John? A lot of tech stocks, which we know are among the favorites of hedge funds, which have felt a lot of pain this year as rates have gone up. Kelly, thank you. Looking for a bounce, and maybe we've got one for now at least. We're up by 6 or 7 tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq, on the S&P, up by 4 tenths of 1%. One topic, you know what it is. Investors still searching for a bottom. To the most volatile months of the year. Historically and seasonally, September and October tend to be the most volatile times. September and October are normally when you get markets going down sharply. September is going to tell us a lot. September tends to be the worst month. Lock up, you throw in the towel for the year. I wouldn't be surprised if equity markets go down a bit further from here. The U.S. economy is going to continue to slow in coming months. If we're going into recession, then likely the lows aren't in. Been looking for about 3,500, and the SPX is the butt rock bottom. The market will bottom. It's going to be much harder to identify a viable bottom. And we think that's probably sometime between probably September and December. And Peter Chair of Academy wrote to start of the week, wake me up when September ends. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo sees a better path into year end, saying a retest of the lows may not come until the first half of 23. Chris, I'm pleased to say, joined us now. Chris, I think this is where we've got to start with you. And thanks for being with us, by the way, buddy. It's always great to catch yeah. up. That is your view, and it separates you from the big bears out there. The weakness that they're looking for in earnings at the end of this year, you don't think comes until the beginning, the front half of 2023. What's the difference between you and them, Chris? How do you get there? Yeah, so we get there a couple ways. Let, John, let, let's kind of roll back the clock, right? So in the summertime, we talked about 4,300 being high, the big risk being interest rates. Interest rates could move higher. Well, interest rates did move higher. But what's, what's notable about interest rates moving higher is it looks like European rates pulled U.S. rates higher. And why did European rates go higher? Well, it was because of inflation, but really bad decisions around energy and energy policy. So stocks are down because of bad decisions over in Europe. Does that make a whole lot of sense to you? It doesn't to me, right? And at the end of the day, what we need to see, if you're going to get stock to retest low, you have to start seeing the pre-announcements over the next couple of days, the next couple of weeks. If you don't see those pre-announcements, I don't see us retesting the lows. And I have a few more thoughts, but let me stop there and see, um, see which direction you want to go in. Well, Chris, let me pick up on what you've been talking about in your notes, and that's corporate outreach, the roadshows, the conferences. You say that that outreach hasn't diminished. What's the signal there, and what typically is the correlation between what happens there and what happens with the market? John, that's perfect. So in the summertime, the head of our corporate access came to me and said, Chris, one of the things we're not seeing is we're not seeing, we're not seeing the corporate retrench. They still want to do non-deal roadshows. They still want to go out to conferences. And, and what, his, what the head of our corporate access said to me is typically when the economy slows down, that's not something that you see. What they want to do is they want to go back home. They want to take care of business or they really don't want to talk to the street because there's not much to talk about. And the conference season is packed this year. And, and we view that as a very strong signal. We've also viewed the fact that the Fed is likely to decelerate after this meeting. And that's a very good positive for equities. So there's a lot out there. And, and, and as you point out, and, and, and as you highlighted, sentiment is very, very poor. Everyone is waiting for the next shoe to drop. Everyone thinks everything's going to fall apart right here, right now. And we think the first half of next year is going to be difficult. But you pulled, you pulled ahead a little bit too much risk and a, a little too much doom and gloom. So, Chris, let's talk about what's worked and whether you'd lean the other way. One thing you talk about in some of your research is this long software trade, very defensive, short semis, highly cyclical, and how that's worked well. Are you thinking about leaning in the other direction? Yeah, John, that's worked really well. That's a consensus trade. We are underweight software. We've been underweight software for some time, just against the broader market, not, not against semis. But it looks like it's too consensus at this point in time. It looks like a lot of the bad news around cyclicals, um, especially semis, is really priced in. And I could see, see that trade going the other way um, between sometime between now and year end. So I, what we're telling clients is, hey, it's working. It's great. Um, but we'll be looking for an out. We'll be looking to take some profits on that trade. Chris, Brent and WTI down hard today, off by 4% on crude to 83.40 on WTI. Brent crude to break a 90. So we're really rolling
energy policy is going to keep supplies pretty constrained. And so the longer term picture is very good. But right here, right now, that's not a place that we really, really want to delve into. We do like that growth, that growth at any, uh, excuse me, that growth at a reasonable price um, type stock. And that's where we want to place our bets. Chris, final question for you. NASDAQ Composite before today, seven days of losses, down close to eight, nine percentage points over that time frame. For the passive investors out there looking at that index, the NASDAQ 100, to be precise, what would you do with it, Chris? What would your advice be to them be? Yeah, that, that, John, that's a good question because we don't look at the NASDAQ explicitly, explicitly right? We, we generally look at the different sectors. We look at the different stocks. And, and what we would say is if you can find stocks, and there are plenty of large cap stocks and there are plenty of growth stocks that are trading at reasonable prices, that's the portfolio that we want longer term. That's where we want to place our bets. As far as the market overall, we do think you're setting up for an oversold bounce, um, which includes the NASDAQ. But if you're building a portfolio, really look for those reasonably priced growth stocks because the economy is slowing down, inflation is coming off the boil. And there was a massive derating in the first half of this year, which has uncovered, funny enough, some, a lot of value in the growth space. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Chris, appreciate it, sir. As always, working through some of these issues. Right now, about 13 minutes into the session, equities positive four tenths of 1% on the NASDAQ, up about three quarters of 1%. We'll catch up with Mike McKee next to go through what's coming up through the day ahead, including a ton of Fed speak as well. From New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs> just another shock hitting the global economy and of course from the China perspective it, it's, it's not surprising that growth is so weak because there is no consumption engine to drive growth and also you have the slowdown in the rest of the world um, and so you cannot grow uh, just based on your exports. Growth is likely to remain slow until something turns. China's export growth slowing more than expected in August. This coming as dollar strength continues weighing on the yuan, extending its decline and inching closer and closer to a seven handle. Joining us now is Mike McKee and Taylor Riggs. Mike McKee, that data in China not looking great. Now, people are beginning to suspect that things are worse in China than the Chinese are letting on, but they don't want to say anything until the party congress is over next month. The trade figure is pretty dismal. Exports up just 7.1% in the month of August. That is less than half of what the uh, July figure was. Imports up 3.8%. So both of those slowing significantly. Some of this is base effects, but they also get a boost from a stronger dollar. So uh, it is worse than it appears just in that chart there. And it is having an effect throughout Asia. You take a look at uh, what's been happening with imports to China from countries like South Korea, which sends in material to be assembled, like Australia, which sends in raw materials, and those uh, countries are selling a lot less to the Chinese right now. Uh, the United States and the EU also seeing the impacts. The uh, shipments to trading partners in the U.S. were down 3.8 percent. That's the first time in 26 months that we've seen a decline. Europe also down a little bit as well, and uh, given the European economy not selling to China is not good news for them. So this is just another in the latest of a number of signals that say China on the back of COVID zero and declining global demand is having some real problems now. 699.71, either session on dollar China. Taylor, we got this far away. And that's right. When you point out sort of the key seven per dollar level, of course, that is under focus. You're getting a little bit of some movement here, uh, to Mike's point, a little bit in the yuan. So we're taking a look at trying to get up some strength, but really not moving the needle. This, John, of course, comes if you change up the board. What has been 11 straight days of stronger than expected fixings? Think of this as the PBOC really coming in to try to support the currency, setting some of these key levels. But frankly, it's not really doing a uh, much here to move the needle. So this certainly has been something that we're watching when we think about some of the emerging markets, some of the other Asian currencies as well. And that leads me to my next point, John, because this hasn't just been stronger dollar yuan weakness. This has also been to the bottom of the screen there a lot about the yen as well. Some big dollar strength relative to yen weakness. There's a strategist over at NatWest Market saying that there's been regional momentum, other positioning factors in play after the yen broke that key psychological level of 140. So you're really getting some of these technicals as well coming into play. 10% move yet today. It's quite a move. Taylor, thank you. Looking forward to the close a little bit later with Taylor Riggs, Remain Bostick and Caroline Hyde. Your equity market about 20 minutes into the session, firm about half of 1%. NASDAQ bouncing back up eight tenths of 1% with your sector price action. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, yes, we do have gains for the S&P 500. It's the first or second update, I should say, in eight days. So a bit of a reprieve for the bold. And most sectors at this point are higher. The best stock on the day, Apple. So not surprisingly, tech is one of the top sectors. The top sector, though, interestingly, is yesterday's top sector, utilities, up 1.7%. Today, it's a little bit more justified from a yield standpoint. Yields are down, so the dividends look a little bit better. But as you know, this is a defensive sector. So we are leading this charge today with defense. Right below it, though, consumer discretionary being led by Tesla, interestingly, and then communication services being led by Twitter. Both of those stocks are higher. But the worst sector, as you know, energy down 2.5%. This, of course, is crude oil. Uh, WTI has broken $85 per barrel. Is at its lowest level since January. We also have Brent crude back below 90. Some of the big laggards on the day, not surprisingly, are some of those energy movers, including Exxon Mobil, uh, along with uh, Devin and Halliburton. A rough day for energy. And it's going to be interesting to see whether this top sector on the year this year and last year, if it can stay in this place, if crude oil does, in fact, continue to slide on that strong dollar. Abby, thank you. You're trading diary. Up next. <laughs> What do you think is happening in the blockchain industry right now? I think in the long run, DeFi wins. DeFi wins because it's a better system. It's composable, it's transparent, it's cheaper because you're just code. You don't have all these people in this legacy infrastructure.
certainly energy security has elevated its position and certainly we're going through a transition we have to do it more sustainably and I think they're struggling with how to write the right policy to encourage early time investment yet figure out how they want to go through the transition and some of what they're talking about with excess profits tax it's going to have the unintended consequence of reducing supply long term. Whatever we do one thing is for sure we have to save electricity but we have to save it in a smart way. If you look at the costs of electricity there are peak demands and this is what is expensive because in these peak demands the expensive gas comes into the market. What we need to do is increase our energy supplies long term. And that is why we will open up more supply in the North Sea, which the Honourable Gentleman has opposed. That is why we will build more nuclear power stations, which the Labour Party didn't do when they were in office. And that is why we will get on with delivering the supply as well as helping people through the winter. It is the number one issue in the world right now is what happens with energy. I can tell you the good news stay side is the crude is rolling over. Both Brent crude and WTI and equities are bouncing back Hi, by 31% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, up by about 6 tenths of 1%. On the Russell, 25 minutes in, up by about a third of 1%. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. A rate decision from the Bank of Canada coming at the top of the hour. We'll also get the Fed's beige book and Fed speak from Mesler, Brainerd and Barr all on the agenda. An ECB rate decision coming up on Thursday, followed by President Christine Lagarde's news conference. Plus, at the same time, at the same time we have a news conference from the ECB, you'll hear from Chap Out delivering remarks from Washington, D.C. And finally, more Fed speak to close out the week with Evans Waller and Esther George from New York City. For our audience worldwide, this was the Countdown to the Open. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg.如果你炒股喜欢做短线，而且啊还处于迷茫期，我想和你打个赌。
strong within strong economic momentum, that uh, worries us less. Um, if this was a period where oil prices were low, economic activity was weak, and we were actually seeing a uh, rising rate cycle, then it could mean more worries on the asset quality. Of course, I mean, um, if you see, speak to bank managers of the Middle East banks, they would always say that they're navigating uncertain times globally. But if you look more locally, the macro is quite supportive. And if you look across the banks, yep. asset quality has been quite robust so far. Okay, so I'm a believer. I'm a believer in that. In that, NIMS will win re relative to, to provisioning. Um, let's talk about lending. A lot of bank analysts and, and, and various uh, various sell side come on the show and they say you want to be long sided banks. There's going to be a heck of a, a lending explosion. Now we were looking at the chart and you've identified this as well in terms of the loan growth uh, and the mortgage loan growth um, decelerating slightly. I think that's natural enough. You know, rates are rising, banks are repricing, uh, and you're beginning to see a little bit of a reappraisal. Let's say in the mortgage approvals in Saudi Arabia, which is what we're showing on the screen at the moment. Are you worried about running out of a bit of puff in, in Saudi? bank lending to the retail level? Sure. I mean, a couple of points here. I mean, if you, if you look at the chart that you're showing, uh, there is a little bit of seasonality. So July is a slowdown, but if you go back okay. to June 2021, there's a little bit of a seasonal slowdown as well. Number two, a very important point on retail in particular, most of these retail loans are fixed rate. Um, so as a result, uh, you know, it's not a one is to one pass through. It takes a little bit of time for uh, high rates to pass through. Mortgages are fixed rate for longer tenure. Uh, personal loans are fixed rate uh, for uh, three to five years. So effectively, there's a lag impact of high rates on retail origination. And if you look, despite the slowdown in July, Overall, retail origination momentum is quite strong. We're still doing, you know, double-digit lending uh, across retail uh, mm -hmm. construct. Now, you're in London, and uh, as we can see behind you, you're, you're having your, your forum for Middle East banks talking to institutional investors. It's a, it's a lovely place to convene uh, and a beautiful time of the year. But I'm, I'm curious to know what's top of the agenda by the institutional investors who are coming into this beauty parade. Is it about the foreign ownership level? Are they thinking of making active switches from ownership in Europe into Middle Eastern banks? And is that being driven by FOL? Yeah, so a very fair point. I mean, look, there, there we have a wide variety of investors here. There are global investors who are looking to kind of look at Middle East from a more resilience point of view, obviously, pay currencies, uh, supporting market backdrop. And then you've got your emerging market investors, as you rightly said, looking to uh, address the underweight uh, that they have at this moment to uh, the Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia. And obviously, the key debate, uh, which is always there around the Middle Eastern banks, is around valuation. Um, given the uh, relative outperformance that we've seen of the Middle East banks and where valuation stack up versus EM, the main question is if the growth is strong enough uh, to sustain these valuations and if there's further outperformance from here. And a lot of the debate has been around uh, loan growth for uh, the Middle Eastern banks, particularly Saudi banks, on the, mm -hmm. on the corporate side, as Saudi delivers on, on its vision 2030. Uh, and then, obviously, the impact of uh, rate hikes and the question that you uh, that you put to me, how much of this is price in, how much is, uh, is, is more to go? And all of this in a period where there is uh, you know, global uncertainty. So Middle Eastern banks looking to navigate uh, that, that uncertainty. And we've had I mean, uh, senior level attendance, CFO, okay. CEOs from all the major banks in the region, and that was the most posed question to them. Okay, well, listen, we'll leave you, we'll leave you to, to do the beauty parade and the hustle. Willie, please tell the bank CEOs not to be frightened. We don't ask hard questions. We just want to know why we should invest in their banks. So do the job for me. Some of them don't take our calls often enough. Wally Mushin there, Managing Director for Global Investment Research at Goldman Sachs. Bet you Shane Nelson's on that trip. Good morning, Shane. You're always welcome here at Bloomberg. Plenty more ahead uh, on Daybreak Middle East. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> It's Egypt's second international conference forum underway in Cairo, and the meeting convenes the heavy hitters in the fields of politics, finance, and climate, such as John Kerry, Mark Carney, were on the ground along with the president of the EBRD, the corraller of the, the great and the good. It's Egypt's Minister for International Cooperation, Rania al -Mashad. Dr. Rania, thank you very much for joining me. Um, sadly, I'm not there, but you've, you've, you've managed to up the game with who is there. What I want to get a sense from you is what is the message at this gathering, that this international cooperation gathering, as Egypt is on the precipice of another IMF bailout. What's your financial message this morning at this gathering? Good morning. Good morning, Manas. Uh, yes, this is the second edition of uh, the Egypt International Cooperation Forum. Uh, and this year, it also hosts the ministers uh, from Africa for finance, economy, and environment. Uh, and the key message is uh, that uh, access to finance, mobilization of resources for climate action uh, is very, very urgent for the African continent. Uh, as you mentioned, yesterday there was an assembly of global uh, policy leaders. We had the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Amina Mohammed, 
who has to do with finance and SDGs. Uh, we had uh, John Kerry, we had uh, Mark Carney, and of course the president of the EBRD and other uh, financial inter multilateral development banks were represented as well. Uh, so it was uh, a very important uh, uh, gathering. Uh, we will come out with a communique at the end of the conference on the 9th of September, uh, and this is supposed to be a launch pad for Finance Day uh, at COP. COP is less than 60 days away. Uh, and of course, uh, being in Sharm el-Sheikh, being from Egypt, uh, it's considered an African COP, the voice of the South. And you and I were together in Singapore last year, and you made it very clear at, at the plenary session that the demands from the West or the DM markets for Africa were extreme, uh, if I can paraphrase. My memory's not exact on, on, on the wording that we use. But you have an African finance day. You're going to host that. What are the demands? What is, what's the size of the demands from the African nations and the developing nations uh, as we go to this COP? Do you think they're going to up the demands? And what will they be? So, so yes, you're absolutely right, Madison. We were together in, in Singapore. The message was uh, the expectation from Glasgow. There are trillions of dollars pledges uh, that have been made to finance climate action in different countries, developing and emerging, and of course, African countries. However, these pledges have not made their way to the ground. And we mentioned then that countries rated B and below may not have that access. So how can we create innovative financial tools, blending uh, finance to be able to crowd in private investments uh, into a very important projects for climate, not just mitigation projects on the energy front, but also for food security and water security, which are known as adaptation projects. So this was a message uh, very uh, loud yesterday. Uh, we had, of course, uh, both uh, Secretary Kerry as well as Mark Carney, head of GFANS, uh, uh, both uh, trying to mobilize or crowding in private sector. Uh, the message was very clear. Also, President Abdel Fattah Sisi was there uh, mentioning the financing gap for Africa uh, close to in order to uh, push the climate uh, action more than uh, 800 billion dollars required how do we close that gap how do we create investable projects and therefore this COP, the key theme is from pledges to implementation and, and, and part of that uh, and judy bind of course as you go to the imf uh with, with the request i know that you were the international development and cooperation hub dr rania but you talk about financing gap within the COP side, but from a nation state you have an external funding gap you talk to the world bank you are the linchpin to the world bank and are there active talks by you with the World Bank, let's say, for international financing or any form of support? So, as you know, you know, Matt, is that for uh, IMF programs, uh, the program has to be fully financed. And for that to, uh, to occur, uh, we also uh, get financing from our bilateral partners. And as you mentioned, uh, multilateral uh, development banks, such as the World Bank, the African Development Bank, uh, and the Asia mm -hmm. Infrastructure Investment Bank, et cetera. Egypt has been uh, able to mobilize uh, this type of financing uh, because this is also related not just to budget support, but also to project finance. And that's why yesterday uh, we uh, launched the Egypt Country Platform for the Nexus of Water, Food, and Energy, which is the Nwefi program. Nwefi in Arabic means fulfilling promises. Uh, and hence, our mobilization of financing from the multilateral development banks uh, is a good uh, course, uh, and it is happening uh, both happened in 2020, 2021, and continuing in 2022. And if I was to just push you a little bit, Dr. Rani, and say, you know, are you hopeful that you will get additional complementary funding from EBRD or WB in conjunction? I know the IMF sits in, in another remit, but are you optimistic and in active talks to open additional financing, additional support for the country from those uh, agencies? So just uh, uh, last month, uh, we were able to uh, uh, get a budget support for 271 million from the African Development Bank and 500 million from the World Bank under uh, food response. Uh, and also, uh, there are other uh, bilaterals that are, we're working with. Uh, so on that front, uh, things are moving, uh, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, in progress. Okay, Dr. Rania, thank you very much for joining me. Have a good day. Uh, sounds as if you, you, you've got them all on the ground, one place, one time. Good luck with COP. And I look forward to seeing you in Singapore at the New Economy Forum in just a couple of months. Dr. Rania al Egypt's Minister for International Cooperation, uh, joining the show today from uh, Cairo. This is Bloomberg. Wheat futures jumped after Vladimir Putin criticized a grain deal with Ukraine. The Russian president says that the shipment corridor is not helping the poorest country. Simone Foxman is in Doha. So the gas is fully weaponized. It sounds like we're in the building blocks for stage two on the grains front. Simone, what can you tell us this morning? 
Well, Putin's criticism was that a lot of these exports are actually ending up in the European Union. According to the UN, about a third of the grain exports coming through the corridor from Ukraine are actually going to European countries. But this overlooks a couple of things, and it gets at that criticism by President Putin about this not helping poorer countries. So for one, yes, a third of this is going to Europe, but 20% is going to Turkey, and then 30% of those grain exports are going to what are described as low or lower middle income countries, many of them in our region. Also important for our region is that this grain corridor deal has helped expedite some Russian supplies of grain, so uh, grain shipping from Russian ports, helping that go to this region. Importantly, countries like Egypt, Jordan, Turkey, and Iran have recently received uh, supplies of wheat from Russia. Also important to note that some of these grain purchases are classified as going to the United States or elsewhere, but they're really going to the World Food Program. The World Food Program is supporting countries across Northern Africa, across Africa generally, and of course the likes of Yemen and Syria, so really important there. And then finally, crucially, you know, when we look at the, what consumers are facing on the ground, folks in Lebanon are still seeing wheat flour up 200% from when this war began. So although we've seen futures come down overall, and not necessarily yesterday, come down overall, consumers aren't really feeling that. So any uncertainty that Putin uh, brings up here is likely to increase the volatility, increase potentially the insecurity for countries in our region, and that's kind of why we're going to follow this so closely. Let's just shift over to Iraq, because we've got, look, we know that there's political instability, but we've got one of the top courts now um, rejecting a bit to dissolve parliament. How does that, how does that play out politically? This decision was something that I guess could have been a release valve for some of this political angst. And essentially this decision meaning that wasn't open. This wasn't something that was unexpected per se, but the followers of Muqtada al-Sadr, that important Shia cleric who won the most votes in the last election but was unable to uh, form a government, that's what these guys were calling for. We're calling for the court to dissolve parliament, to go to new elections. So this decision really just deepening the stalemate and of course raising the potential for uh, continuing political violence. Um, take a look at a chart here we have also as well in our GTV Go for clients. We've seen the impact that the recent uh, disruptions have had, the recent political angst has had on investor confidence in Iraq uh, with the bond yields for 2028 debt going above 10 percent. Of course, this hasn't filtered in to oil markets because it hasn't really affected oil supply, but that also a concern that would broaden the political divisiveness we've seen in Iraq beyond Iraq itself. And on Egypt, just caught up with uh, Dr. Rania Amashat there. She's obviously trying to sort of set out the roadmap for COP for the African nations. They're all grappling with inflation. It's a global issue, but it's expected later today from Egypt. What's on the EST? That was a very interesting discussion, Amanis, with Rania. Yes, but inflation expected to accelerate yet again for the month of August from 13.6% year-on-year in July. We've seen food and fuel prices really contribute to that. We also expect to continue to see producers passing on the increase in their uh, input prices to consumers, and that's likely what we're going to see in the numbers today. A lot of the discussion recently has focused also on the potential continuing devaluation of the Egyptian pound, uh, the potential to let this be a more flexible currency, of course, if we see any developments on that matter. That would only push, push inflation higher, but at least for now, the data as we see them uh, likely to go higher accelerating yet again in the month of August. Simone, thank you very much. Simone Foxman at the Qatar Financial Center in Doha. Wow, is all I can say. I want you to focus in on Aussie yen, never mind dollar yen. Look at that Aussie yen cross. Take a bath. This is the Aussie down against the yen, of course, on Mr. Lowe's comments. Uh, maybe we're coming to the end of the jumbo drama rama rate hikes. That's repriced the Aussie right the way across the curve. Now, when it comes to the yen, yes, the yen is still lower and the dollar is still higher. 143.98. By the way, 1998 was the last time there was G2 intervention, which Janet Yellen has made very, very clear is something which should be rare and exceptional. I love these yellow lines. I take you back. It was June 1998. Where was I in 1998? Don't know. Um, Yes, I think it was a bond broker. Bad bond broker. 146 is where she was. The, Af the Asian financial crisis was hot. Russia defaulted and there was intervention. This puppy moved by six big figures. When there's sizable intervention, it moves. Verbal intervention is of no use to anybody. And minute movements by central banks have no impact. It's a beautiful day in London. Danny Berger came to work today. This is Bloomberg. Apple has identified its next big business, bringing advertisements to more parts of your iPhone. Today, Apple pushes ads in three places, the App Store, Apple News, and the Stocks app. In the News and Stocks apps, Apple shows display advertisements. That means that third-party companies like car dealerships or mortgage lenders can showcase their advertisements just like they can on a website. On the App Store, the situation is different. There, Apple has search ads. This allows developers to buy their way into showing up higher on search results. 
For instance, an App Store developer can bid for the term car racing or basketball so their apps would surface above competing apps in the list of results. Apple's push into ads is a little ironic given that its ATT or app tracking transparency privacy feature limits the ability for Meta, Snap, and even smaller developers to generate as much revenue as possible from advertising. That's because the feature allows users to choose if they want their data collected and tracked across third-party apps and websites. Still, Apple's hoping to expand its own ads business and is planning to add search ads to its Maps app. Other areas where ads could eventually appear are on Apple Books and Apple Podcasts, along, maybe one day, with an ad-supported tier of Apple TV Plus to compete with new offerings from Netflix and other streaming video providers. I'm Mark Gurman. This is Power On. Markets count down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Manish Cranny in Dubai with the stories that set your agenda. As long as it takes, Lael Brainard joins a chorus of Fed speakers vying to do whatever is needed to beat inflation. Next up, Lagarde. The ECB is on the brink of a jumbo 75 basis point hike, even as recession risks rise. This is the EU leader's ready emergency energy measures. Most likely outcome, the BOE's Andrew Bailey reiterates a recession is probable. Sterling hits a Thatcher era low as Liz Truss enters 10 Dining Street. Danny, good to see you this morning. Good to have you back. Le tête peloton. What do I mean by that? It's Stephen Major's phrase. It's about the Aussies. They've shifted gears. They are maybe calling time for Mr. Lowe on those jumbo rate hikes. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Manis. And relief in this bond market. At least someone seems like they're slowing down. We also had the Bank of Canada yesterday going out at 75 basis points instead of 100. Now, yep. I don't think that that's what we can assign this equity market rally to necessarily yesterday. Manis, let me take you into what the futures are doing because we are seeing Europe start to rally this morning. Again, we saw a rally of nearly 2% for U.S. stocks. So half a percent, that's what we're seeing on the Euro stocks 50 futures. S&P, NASDAQ, those up again. They are higher. They were unchanged. But then we had that Aussie, rate to, uh, that Aussie news coming out from Mr. Lowe that also helped to support stocks as well as bonds. But Manis, in terms of my argument, why yesterday wasn't about the fundamentals, it's because of this next thing. It is the Goldman Sachs index of most shorted stocks that rallied nearly four and a half percent yesterday, more than double, double the index. <clears throat> That would suggest the sense that yesterday was short covering. Indeed, we continue to see that around the 3,900 level in the S&P 500. No, we are also saying that CTAs, those trend followers, were near max short. So, Manis, I put it to you, perhaps yesterday was just a little bit of short covering. Yeah, I think there was a desperate desperation to write up a narrative that Lael Brainard gave us a two-sided risk. Uh, Michael Burry says, look, two SPACs failing is not enough to call the bottom, nor does Goldman Sachs see the bottom of it here. Cross asset, it's all about currency. It's all about the propensity yeah. uh, to see the lows, whether 1985 is the low. Uh, I've been gone. Cable, by the way, managed to add back 100 basis points, 100 bips yesterday. Now, that was more dollar softness than it was sterling strength. 115.04, yes, we have made it to the lowest since 1985. And, of course... I want to know what love is. Was number one when Sterling troughed in 1985. Citigroup stays stay, stay short. State Street warned on the twin deficits. We'll have more from uh, Virus Patel later. He's not so concerned. He wants opportunities to buy Sterling. NYMEX has managed to turn it around. It tanked by 6% yesterday on China's slowdown, gloom and doom. Rates have repriced aggressively this morning on this narrative from the RBA. Mr. Lowe, but maybe we're at the end of jumbo rate hikes. And so you're seeing 10-year paper uh, drop. Dollar yen. Well, you know what? What does it take to break this intervention is probably the only thing. It was 1998. And that is when you saw monster intervention in the middle of the Asian financial crisis and a Russian default. And it's only monster intervention that move the end then. Let's get to the team. In Asia, Juliet Sally standing by in Singapore with the very latest. Hey, Manus, I am at the team. Look, we are seeing Asian stocks rebound from these two-year lows. The regional benchmark index up by around 1% after we had seen quite a hefty lot of losses. But we're still looking at the weakness in the currency market, and particularly the PBOC's efforts to really stem this decline in the yuan. They had a 12th straight day today of intervention with a stronger fix, but you are still seeing that offshore decline and getting close to the 7 line. Uh, now, of course, you mentioned those comments coming through from RBA Governor Lowe Westpac saying, look, you could see this test the 67 level on the Aussie, which is leading declines in the G10 space. But we have been seeing a big surge coming through in bonds and that repricing you spoke about on the global bond market as traders start to uh, suggest that perhaps we are done with these supersized hikes from the RBA. And what does that mean for the global central bank picture as well? You've got the 10-year yield down 14 basis points. The three-year yield in Australia has been down by as much as 23 basis points. And this is the repricing that you are seeing. Now, before the jumbo-sized hike that we saw on Tuesday, Danny, you're actually still suggesting that you could see hikes out into August next year. Now you're looking at the fact that these hikes could end in April or at least pause there. So the market very much taking these comments from RBA Governor Lowe as the fact that these jumbo hikes are potentially over. He's also talking about the impact to households because, of course, as we know, rate hikes lag. So we're only just starting to see the effect of that first interest rate hike of the cycle. Danny. Yeah, it looks like some spill over to the U.S. to a bid, a slight bid for U.S. 10 years. Uh, yields about three basis points lower. Juliet, thanks so much. Juliet Sally in Singapore. Now let's get to our other reporters from around the world. And of course, not just the RBA. It's a big day for central banks. We're going to discuss the latest Fed speak with Enda Curran. Maria Tadeo, she's in Frankfurt ahead of the ECB decision later today. And Lizzie Burden is here with us in London to digest the latest from the Prime Minister and the Bank of England. Manus. Well, Rachel Chang also gives us the very latest on the lockdowns in China. So let's uh, think about that. You've got top Fed officials continuing to pledge aggressive rate hikes ahead of the fight against inflation. It's the vice chair, Lael Brainard. She spoke about the central bank having to raise rates and keep them there for some time. 
we're in this for as long as it takes to get inflation down. So far, we've expeditiously raised the policy rate to the peak of the previous cycle, and the policy rate will need to rise further. Let's get to Ender Karan, our Chief Asia Economics Correspondent in Hong Kong. So, Ender, look, there's no doubt about it. The Vice Chair there making it very, very clear um, and tagging Loretta Mester, really, in terms of the trajectory. We've got higher to go and more work to do. Yeah, a very direct message, man. There's no real ambiguity there. Making the point, actually, as well, Ms. Brainerd, was that she wants to see rates go into restrictive territory. So that's jargon for when interest rates really do start to bite economic activity around the US. Now, she did give a nod, though, to the two-sided risks uh, in terms of what happens when you're raising borrowing costs. So she's conscious that at some point all of this will start to create pain in the economy, although she clearly doesn't seem to be there yet. She didn't give much of a nod to whether she's in the 75 basis point camp or the 50 basis point camp. That debate will clearly continue. And of course, we, we will have US inflation data ahead of then. Interestingly, though, we did also have Goldman Sachs this morning come out, and they increased their forecast for what the Fed will do this month. They're now expecting 75 basis points hike, they had expected 50 basis points, and they're seeing them go by 50 in November when they were thinking about maybe a 25 basis points move there. So when you consider it all together, it's still a pretty hawkish outlook for the Fed. Interest rates obviously going in one direction. It's only a question of debating, are they going to go by 75 or will it be by 50? All right, Enda, thank you very much. Enda Kern, there, our Chief Asia Economics Correspondent in Hong Kong. And of course, all of that impacting what the ECB does as well. It will be holding its first monetary policy meeting today since July, when officials raised the key rate for the first time since 2011. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Frankfurt. Maria, first off, great to have you back. So the ECB on track for another rate hike, but I guess the question now is how aggressive will that rate hike be? Uh, good morning, Danny. And I'm back in TV, and I have to say, I'm not sure if this is an omen, but it's terrible, atrocious weather uh, today in <laughs> Frankfurt. Now, Danny, the European Central Bank has to hike rates. I mean, that is not a surprise to anyone. This is a single mandate central bank. It's price stability close but below 2%. If you look at the inflation picture across the euro area, in some countries, inflation now more than triples uh, that goal, but they have to, of course, hike. The question, and, and I think you nailed it in your premise there, is uh, how big a hike are we going to get? Is it 75 basis points or 50 basis points? When you look at the 75 uh, camp, what they say is we have a window, and in that window, we should take decisive, swift action. It's the credibility of the central bank that is on the line. When you look at the 50 basis points uh, camp, they argue that you could find yourself in a situation where you hike very aggressively as you enter a recession and an energy crisis. That is a real wild card now for the European economy. Which way this is going to fall, we'll find out very soon at 2.15 Frankfurt time. Maria, good to have you back. No better place to be than outside the ECB, hopefully making news uh, and history. Good to have you back uh, on Team TV. Uh, we'll speak to you a little bit later on in the show. And of course, uh, we will have comprehensive coverage. Maria's there outside the ECB for the rate decision as Madame Lagarde's news conference kicks off at 1.15 p.m. That is UK time, so stay with the Bloomberg team for that. To the UK, the Prime Minister there, Liz Truss, will set out her plan to tackle the soaring energy bills. Meanwhile, the Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey, says the rise in energy prices is likely to contribute to a UK going into a recession. The recession, going back to what, if it, unless, I hope it doesn't happen, but obviously we have forecast it because we think it is sadly the, the most likely outcome, of course, is, is overwhelmingly caused by the actions of Russia and, and the impact on, on energy prices. Let's bring in Lizzie Burden. She was watching that news conference yesterday. Lizzie, good to see you. So the big question is for Liz Truss, a lot of the terrestrial channels talking about the caps yesterday, but it's the debate about who pays for this uh, in terms of the energy uh, intervention, isn't it? Indeed, this is Liz Truss's first big act as the new Prime Minister, dealing with the energy crisis, which of course is at the heart of the cost of living crisis. Documents seen by Bloomberg suggest it's going to cost £200 billion in terms of helping consumers and businesses, which, as we heard from the BOE officials yesterday, could help to bring down inflation in the short term. But as you say, the big question, Manus, is how are you going to pay for this? At Liz Truss's first Prime Minister's questions yesterday, she seemed to rule out a windfall tax, but later on it seemed that perhaps she meant she wouldn't increase or extend it, which of course then means it's going to require a huge amount of borrowing. So what we heard as well from Andrew Bailey, the BOE Governor at that Treasury Select Committee was that perhaps they're going to have to put the brakes on active quantitative tightening, which brings us back to what the former Chancellor Philip Hammond told Liz Truss on Bloomberg TV, the markets are watching. Yeah, huge hurdles for trying to tighten policy when all of this is going on at the moment. Lizzie, thank you so much as always. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden there. Now to China, where the mega city of Chengdu has extended a week-long lockdown in most downtown areas after COVID-19 cases increased. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Rachel Chang. So Rachel, what, what is the latest on the Chengdu lockdown? Right. I mean, Chengdu, a city of 21 million people, they just extended the lockdown. What was very significant, as we've seen before in China, is that they haven't set an end date on the lockdown. That's really the biggest problem, the biggest drag on Chinese growth right now, just the uncertainty around when these cities will be able to exit and be able to get back to business as normal. And if we look at the numbers in Chengdu, 120 local cases today, 90 yesterday, you know, the numbers are just so low, right? So much lower than anything else going on around the world, just reflecting how much that pressure, the stamp out outbreaks, has really gone up ahead of that really important party congress that we're going to see next month. President Xi Jinping is very much going to want to come out on that stage, getting his third term and declaring victory over COVID. So this is really very much status quo in China right now. Okay, uh, let's see how much longer that, that zero COVID policy is held on to. Rachel, thank you very much. Rachel Chung uh, with the very latest there. Coming up, we're going to speak to RBC Europe Limited Managing Director and Head of Investment Strategy, Frédéric Carrier, joins the team. Plus, as the greenback strengthens and dark clouds gather over the global economy, we're going to discuss the Benjamins with Vonda Research FX and global macro strategist Viraj Patel. Stay with us for that. This is Bloomberg.
Why does everybody want to be a consultant and what are all these consultants doing? Well, David, I think that we actually defy the label consultant because sometimes consultant seems to imply that we only give advice. And when you look at what Accenture does, we're really different than the traditional version of a consultant. We're really about relevance and results. And that's what is uh, driving our business. What about a consulting project? In my example, I'm the CEO, I have a problem. I call you up, I say, solve my problem or give me a solution. We don't operate as big companies permanently in crisis mode. And so when you think about like, how long does it solve things, a lot of it starts with you know the company being willing to set aggressive goals. And so what we are trying to do now is work with our clients to work differently and to work faster. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. Bloomberg, the open with Jonathan Farrell. Drilling down in the numbers and preparing you as only Bloomberg can. Weekdays on Bloomberg. Inflation in our country is just far too high. Uh, we're not close to the Federal Reserve's uh, target for inflation. And so I'm quite focused, and the Fed is quite focused, on making sure we do the steps necessary to bring inflation back down to its target. So I'm, I am committed to doing that. I know my colleagues at the Fed are committed to doing that. And uh, we understand that in doing that, there may be a sl further slowdown in the economy. Michael Barr, Fed Vice Chair for Supervision there on inflation, just being far too high menace. He was speaking, of course, at the Brookings Institute in Washington. And then, of course, Danny, you've got Goldman Sachs. They've shifted gears as well. They've lifted their forecast mm. for the pace of rate hikes by the Fed. They say that you're going to get 75 basis points this month, 50 basis points in November, upping the game. No end of a jumbo rate hike in sight from the Fed. Does Frederick Carrier, head of investment strategy at RBC Wealth Management, concur? So Goldman's are upping their game. More jumbo rate hikes to come from the Fed now. So I think much more expeditious action from the Fed. Is that part of your narrative? How quickly do we get to, let's say, 4%? on rates, Frederic, and that richness in yield, that seems to entice you at the moment because you've gone from neutral to underweight uh, on, on bonds there. So a two-pronged question. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so may I correct you, we went from underweight to neutral in U.S. Uh, fixed income uh, when the yields uh, went uh, exceeded 3 uh, percent um, because we thought uh, there would start to be some, some opportunities. With respect to how um, we see Fed action, uh, we are um, expecting 50 basis points at the next meeting uh, and then we're seeing the labor market starting to weaken a little bit we think that this is the one factor that the fed will be really focused on uh, and so we expect mm. 25 basis points uh, subsequently so 50 basis points 25 and 25 uh, until the, the end of the year Having said that, we think that uh, September may mark uh, an inflection point. Central banks have been very aggressive in increasing interest rates. Uh, they have responded yeah. in the West very aggressively. Um, and we think that this might be the last month where we have this uh, consorted, uh, synchronized, aggressive action. We think that the Fed will start to decrease, will likely start to decrease the pace of interest rates, while uh, the Bank of England and the ECB will have to continue to be aggressively hiking rates. Frederick, great, great, great timing for that viewpoint, considering the RBA just kind of did what exactly you're describing, saying that they're looking at slowing the pace of rate hikes here on out. But Frederick, I think that unemployment point is very fascinating. We just had this paper come out of a think tank in D.C. presented at a Fed conference basically saying that unemployment will need to be significantly higher for the Fed to reach its inflation target. In your strategy, what sort of levels are you looking at to see that change, to see that inflection point, and then an inflection point in, in how you address and what you invest in? So, um, the central banks have all been very clear that uh, in order to reduce inflation, we might have to have a recession, uh, and this will mean a higher um, um, higher unemployment. Uh, it will likely mean a decrease in, in GDP peak to trough of about 1.8%. Uh, but as we see uh, the sign of uh, of the impact of higher interest rates on the economy, we think that uh, the Fed will be mindful and therefore will decrease the pace of interest rate hikes. The debate in the equity market is you say that this oversold, oversold equities could rally from here, but the upside is capped. I, I'm just curious. I mean, we made a great deal of the summer of love, a 20%, near 20% rally in U.S. equities. We've given back 8% uh, on, on that pretty stunning rally. Your assessment of the equity narrative. I had one guest this morning saying, let's go to 50% cash. Uh, well, we think that that's, that's uh, for our clients uh, in wealth, we think that's a very a drastic strategy, which is by itself very, very risky. Um, look, we think that sentiment is very depressed at the moment. Markets are oversold, and it, it's possible that there is a rally. However, so long as the Fed is increasing interest rates, it's it's very difficult for the upside to be very strong. We think the upside is, is capped. To have um, a sustainable up leg uh, in markets, you will need uh, the Fed to um, stop its hiking policy that would require uh, inflation, a decisive move downward in inflation. We don't think that the conditions are there at the moment and are unlikely to be there until well into Q1 next year. So that leaves you with a cap upside. Uh, however, the downside uh, is, is quite uh, steep. Uh, lead indicators that we follow indicate a recession next year um, by uh, the first half, the end of the first half of next year. Recessions are always accompanied by bear markets, bear markets which start between five and seven months before the start of the recession. So that makes us very cautious uh, and therefore probably closer to, to benchmark uh, if, if possible. We don't want to take very big risks. Uh, we want to ensure we have quality companies in our portfolios, ensure but, we have but, companies but which are not overly leveraged. If, if, if you don't want to be in 50% cash then, what risk are you willing to take or are you just fleeing to all the defensives right now? 
So we, we prefer defensives uh, at the moment. There are some pockets of opportunities. We can think of US biotech, for instance, uh, on a selective basis. We can think of companies which are involved in decarbonization in Europe, uh, potentially um, energy companies in, uh, in the UK. But alternative strategies uh, are of interest to us, particularly trading strategies, if client uh, risk profiles are warranted. These strategies can really take advantage of the much higher volatility that we're seeing across asset classes. Let's just get a quick line from you, Frederic, in terms of FX, because it is the biggest talked about zeitgeist in markets at the moment, from yen weakness, sterling implosion, and rabid dollar strength. How much weaker does the pound go? Are you fiscally worried? We are, we are very concerned about the imbalances which are uh, building up uh, in, in the UK. Uh, fiscal deficit, um, particularly if we have this energy uh, res you know, rescue package, uh, in addition to lower taxes, so fiscal deficit, which would increase current account deficit, which is very large at uh, up to 8% of GDP. We think that the pound will continue to trade uh, below 120 to the dollar, uh, and certainly the, the technical picture is very bearish. Uh, so uh, until these structural problems are, are dealt with uh, and with a co um, co cohesive, uh, comprehensive uh, policy, uh, we think that the pound will continue to, to weaken, and we haven't even talked about the trading relationship with, with the EU and what will be the, the new government's approach to it. That could be another uh, factor which weighs on the pound in the medium term. Okay, Frederic, really great to get your thoughts this morning. Frederic Carrier there, Head of Investment Strategy at RBC Wealth Management. Thanks so much for joining. Now, coming up on the program with Manus and me, the UK's new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, appears to rule out funding energy support with a windfall tax on companies. This is Bloomberg. China's military power has been growing at an incredible speed over the last 20 years. A strong country must have a strong military, as only then can it guarantee the security of the nation. In terms of sphere of influence, we absolutely know that China wants to be dominant in Asia. So there is a target to get to that point, to be a military that is a peer to the greatest militaries in the world by 2035. The competition for influence is a global one, and through a multi-decade trajectory fueled by planning, money, and pragmatism, China is building a military that allows it to shape the 21st century just as the U.S. shaped the 20th. You're watching Daybreak Europe. I'm Juliet Sully in Singapore with the first word news. Well, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is warning that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan remains a distinct threat. He's insisting the White House's position over the island status hasn't changed, despite Chinese claims to the contrary. He spoke to Bloomberg for the David Rubenstein Show Peer to Peer Conversations. I think it remains a distinct threat uh, that there could be a military contingency around Taiwan. And uh, the People's Republic of China has actually stated as official policy that it is not taking the invasion of Taiwan off the table. That in the UK, new Prime Minister Liz Truss will today set out her plan to tackle soaring energy bills. It will be her first significant act as leader. Truss has been trying to avoid memories of her Tory predecessor, Margaret Thatcher. The UK hit another unwelcome comparison to the Thatcher era yesterday, with the pound falling to the lowest against the dollar since 1985. In the US, President Joe Biden is holding back on a decision to scrap Trump-era tariffs on China imports. We're told that's as the administration studies ways to help businesses seeking relief. Any decision before the US midterm elections in November poses domestic and international risks for Biden and his fellow Democrats. The Federal Reserve's battle to bring inflation under control will likely cause more harm to the U.S. and world economy than anticipated. This according to a pair of papers set for presentation at a Brookings Institution conference this week. One says the Fed will have to push unemployment higher to hit its inflation target. The other warns of the dangers of developing nations from rising U.S. rates and a strong dollar. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Danny Manis. Juliet, thank you so much. Now, coming up, it's all about the Benjamins. The green back strengthens and dark clouds gather over the global economy. We're going to focus in on FX next. This is Bloomberg.
how much of a push have you seen from the Kishida government in terms of green funding? The Kishida administration has committed to doubling the amount of investments in so-called green technologies. I think we need more than just pronouncements. We need real money backing very innovative startups um, and innovative companies in this space. What do you make of Kishida's new capitalism? Well, I think his framework is reflective of the challenges that Japan society is facing, namely uh, that growth has been present, but growth has not been, of course, evenly distributed. But frankly speaking, it's hard to redistribute income if you don't have much income to begin with. If the government and private sector can work together and collaborate uh, to drive more in innovative growth startups, that, that can really drive uh, the income growth that the Kishida government needs to redistribute. This is Bloomberg Day Break Europe. I'm Manus Cranny in Dubai with Danny Berger in London. And these are the stories that set your agenda. As long as it takes, Leo Brainard joins a choir of Fed speakers vowing to do whatever is needed to beat inflation. Up next, Lagarde. The ECB is on the brink of a jumbo 75 basis point hike even as recession risks rise. This as EU leaders ready emergency energy measures. Most likely outcome, the BOE's Andrew Bailey reiterates a recession is probable. Sterling hits a factor error low on Liz Truss's first day in office. And Manus, when it comes to this market, it's all about FX. It's all about currencies with continued superlatives dating back to the 80s. Absolutely. And it's going to be on dollar yen that probably we focus on the most. Danny, have a look, have a look at fourth day in a row. Traders taking, uh, taking another punt uh, on where dollar yen will be. You're looking at uh, some of the, the strongest dollar levels since 1998. They are itching in their pants to get to that level of 145. That were the lows in 1998 when we had intervention. Danny. And I guess if we're worried about the yen, we also have to have on our agenda the pound Wednesday sliding to the lowest level since 1985. And what was top of the charts then? I, I know you just told us, but I completely forgot. <laughs> Viraj Patel loves a punt on the old charts as well. I want to know what love is. It was by far. There we go. And it was 19. That's when that's when that's when Sterling took a bath and made its low. And that was January of that year. But I know there was a few other good songs that year. But far enough. I want to know what love is. No, I'm not saying it, Danny. Well, they want to know what love is. We want to know what the low is. You like that pun? There we go. I'm going to bring that to Viraj Patel, FX and Global Macro well, Strategist at Vanda Research. I mean, Viraj, we've heard from guest after guest saying pound can go lower. We're about to face this balance of payment crisis in the UK. You don't think so. What do you think? Yeah, I think this consensus of how low can you go for sterling is starting to get a bit tiring. And I think, you know, we, on one hand, yes, the fundamentals don't look great. Yes, there is a twin deficit that is widening. But one has to take stock of the move that we have seen so far. And that has priced in a lot of these bad news. So you know, when we're talking about balance of payments crises, when we're talking about your funding crisis for something like the UK economy and the, ster and the pound, which is bearing in mind still a reserve currency, I think that's getting a bit too excessive and a bit wide of the mark. So a lot, a lot of things have to go wrong before we get to that point. And I think on the short term, you know, it's really simple. The one thing that's been driving sterling weakness year to date is this inflation crisis. And anything that eases that on the margin and we're likely to get some policies in the next uh, you know, 24, 48 hours that could be quite constructive here, you know, could actually see a contrarian corrective bounce in sterling, at least on the margin. You know, FX investors like short term narratives, you know, pricing and things like a twin deficit is a factor, but it's not an anchoring point, at least in the short term. So I think, you know, we're getting to a point where, look, I'm not necessarily pushing for a massive big sterling rally here. I do think that the bar for sort of further weakness is equal, if not uh, less convincing than the bar for sort of a bit of a corrective rally from here. Viraj, good to have you back on, on the early show. Welcome. Of course, Hugh Pill will take the other side of that trade. Barclays say inflation might drop to 5% on the back of the energy intervention. But the risk is this, Viraj, is that the Bank of England still needs to be, uh, one could say, aggressive in rate hikes. Uh, so how aggressive do you think they can be? Or do you think the two-year notes rolled over? They tanked yesterday on this narrative that inflation would top out. So how much easier is the Bank of England's job? How many more rate hikes? And is that enough to put a floor under sterling? Two's dropped by 20 basis points in one day, by the way. Viraj. Yeah. It's worth remembering that currency differentials or even rates sort of has rarely driven FX markets this year. If you look at just sterling, that's the archetypal stagflation trade. The market is super short bonds, super short the currency. So it's almost you've seen higher rates equals weaker currency. That's the relationship. So look, we're talking about regime changes here effectively with confidence coming back on, as I said, the easing of that inflation crisis, something positive happening from a policy perspective that pushes out potential recession risks, that pushes out potential uh, need for the Bank of England to be front loaded with its rate hikes. And I think that, you know, if it's a more gentle benign hiking cycle that we get in the next 12 to 24 months, sterling can actually do well in that. So I think we're we're talking about very different sort of parts here. And I think one of the reasons for some of that selling to be weak is really just because there has been a sell Europe, sell UK theme that could start to unwind just because, you know, the bar for further selling is getting pretty, uh, pretty high. Viraj, can I throw another risk possibly into the equation? And, and I'm going to focus here on the UK, but, but this extends to all central banks as we look at perhaps this mis mismatch of politicians trying to deal with the energy crisis, fiscal loosening at a time when banks are trying to tighten. We've seen now that Kwasi Kwarteng says he's going to be meeting with Andrew Bailey weekly. Are you concerned at all about central bank independence in this current environment we're dealing with? It is tricky. Um, we did hear as well from the Bank of England yesterday, you know, this idea that they might even you know, slow down or question 
uh, quantitative tightening or guilt sales as a result of this new sort of potential fiscal spending that's coming through. So, you know, this idea of uh, you know, monetary independence is being questioned and challenged. But, you know, I think to some extent we're almost back to that COVID playbook of coordinated monetary fiscal, uh, uh, I guess, policy in a time of crisis. And I think the markets can be a bit more lenient given just the length of what we've seen in terms of this crisis, the magnitude that is escalating you know, with what we've seen in gas prices and energy prices in the past couple of weeks. And I think in a crisis, you can be a bit more lenient as long as when you get out of that crisis, you return to some sort of normal, I guess, uh, central bank independence. And I think that's what the markets will be looking for. The lady was called Janet Yellen, and her words were, intervention is something which should be rare and exceptional. Um, it's a bit like you turning up on daybreak, Europe is rare, and it's exceptional, <laughs> so we should make the most of it. Uh, the year was 1998. Uh, it was when dollar yen licked 145, excuse me, dollar yen 146, and there was monster intervention. Now, Viraj, what I want to get a sense from you is, what is the risk of real G2, Japan and United States? Because single unilateral intervention is, is worth nothing. What is the risk of G2 intervention in yen? Less than 10%, because the, the honest truth is that nobody wants a weak currency right now, not least the US officials. You know, this dollar strength is doing the exact job that they want in terms of tightening financial conditions and putting downward pressure on inflation. And, you know, the Bank of Japan would love that. And I think the ECB would love that. And so this is a zero sum game when it comes to FX intervention. Uh, but we are getting to the point where, you know, if you look at the Swiss franc, you look at the dollar, both of them up year on year at putting that disinflationary force. Maybe their time to, to do that has, has, has been in the sun. So, you know, to some extent, the focus might shift to the ECB, might shift to the Bank of Japan, where they can do stuff. And I think do stuff from a policy perspective that is hiking rates to at least put a floor on how much those currencies can go lower. So, look, we've got a really important BOJ meeting coming up as well. There's a lot of focus on the Fed. One can imagine that just being sort of short dollar yen here and also holding some short JGBs, just on the risk that the BOJ just throws in the towel, gives those hawks a bit of a, a door into year end, uh, could be quite an interesting sort of way to position, just given how crowded that dovish consensus trade is. But, but Viraj, you know, what you're talking about here is almost the, the historical corollaries don't matter, whether it be the yen, whether it be the dollar. I'm wondering how you actually then find fair value in these crosses if it feels like we can't look at prior valuation metrics um, as our grounding tough fair value, I think, in this post-COVID market is really tough because you're seeing structural changes to everything from current account deficits and surpluses uh, to trade balances because of this, uh, this result in sort of the Ukraine war. So, you know, I think that there has to be some perspective that these, these sort of marks of where fair value is, is moving. Um, you look at even just the dollar yen and its North Star, the 10-year Treasury yield, there's a lot of disconnect even in the recent sessions, which suggests to me that what we're seeing is more momentum selling in the yen rather than sort of fundamentals. So we're looking at short-term metrics, we're looking at long-term metrics, but, you know, a combination of these sort of factors, I think a lot of this terms of trade shock, balance of payment shock that has emanated from higher commodity prices is priced in quite fairly into a lot of these currencies now it was a great trade from starting from march it's played out now one has to think about what does the next three six months look like look i asked one of our guests yesterday we'll close off with this um i quite like what or has had to say the rba outside rate hikes may be near an end um and the case for slow rate hikes may build but in times of great angst yesterday our guest in this section wanted to hide out in bunds where do you want to hide out in currency if you don't if you don't believe the yen's going to materially appreciate or run out of puff then where do you hide in the fx world yeah, it's a, I think it's a great question. I think, to be honest, I'd be looking selectively to play a bit of euro strength, a bit of sterling correction against some of those strong currencies of euro Swissy, sterling Swissy, because I think we're getting to a point where the Swiss franc strength is going to start uh, to, to sort of uh, awaken some of those uh, FX dealers on the S&P desk. And so I think you know, that's one trade. I think equally, you know, looking to add some yen risk is important. I think, like I said, adding a short dollar yen, tail risk, just the position that everyone is wrong on sort of how hawkish the Fed will be and how dovish the Fed, the Bank of Japan will be in a couple of weeks could be interesting. But you know, recession uh, bears will, will, will latch onto things like short Aussie yen and short sort of some of these uh, high beta yen crosses just because that's the classic recession playbook. So I think that's, that's, those are the types of outputs that we're looking at. Okay, Viraj, our resident contrarian, always a pleasure to have you on early with us, Viraj Patel, FX and Global Macro Strategist at Vander Research. Now coming up, windfall taxes. European leaders discuss all the different measures they can take, including taxing energy profits as a crisis deepens. More next. This is Bloomberg. Cryptocurrencies have been very popular. And if a client came to you and said, look, I'd like some cryptocurrencies in my portfolio, what would you say? Oh, we've actually been really deep into crypto, deep into learning about blockchain um, and all of the new businesses. You know, I would characterize us as um, crypto learners. You know, we have made a series of toehold investments on behalf of our clients, um, both in some of the currency baskets as well as with some venture firms um, that are investing primarily in the crypto area. Um, I, I think it has the potential to be completely game changing, um, but it is still such the wild west and so it's so uncertain but there's it has the potential to completely upend everything market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher it got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potential to rise it
大家好，我是徐文老师。你是否和以前的我一样，一听到英文的报纸、英文的新闻，就觉得新鲜不要，那一定很。So the other day, I was reading a paper with research that I was doing, which involved segmenting the lungs from a CT scan, and I found this GitHub profile here from a guy named Sergey Primakov. So, shout out to whoever you are from、uh, Maastricht University, and he had written a paper in、uh, Nature Communications. By the way, Nature Communications is a very highly reputable journal, and. I noticed in the article that he actually provided the code from his project where he segmented the lungs publicly, and it's actually right here, and you can take a look at it. And this is state-of-the-art stuff, and he's using all the modern Python libraries to take basically a 3D CT scan and just return a mask of the lungs.、And、so that's what we're going to look at in this video. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to subscribe as always. Join the Discord server as well. Image processing stuff that is state-of-the-art in Python that we'll be using is a、uh, learn CT scan doing. And you might not pixels, so that'll and the table will be areas here areas to transpose. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to fill in all these small holes in the lungs. They're kind of gross, and、uh, it's easy enough to do with these functions. So first of all, I'm going to turn this back into a binary array where I just have separate areas. In order to do that, I just create a mask, and that's where mask labeled is greater than zero. And of course, if I plot dot If you color mesh this,、uh, again, this is a 3D array. This is not going to work, but I can give it. That.
charges in your points down in the module in question. Um, you can go to the module sidebar at the top and either go down to the segmentation uh, menu and then from there go to volumetric segmentation or you can use the search icon and just type the same thing and it should come up. And then you'll be brought to step one. This module takes the sort of form of a workflow. So you start at step one, you go to step two, three, four, five, and end at six. In each point, you have, we just have to choose which volumes we want to analyze. And press next. Then you go to public cancer image, particular and hopefully nothing else. And it should come. We're just going to start just laying a few Click the list. Just post register. Our paint marker. Finish that off. And that is your segmentation. I again encourage you to check out Slicer's documentation. Use these. This part is very optional and uh, is the interesting of the method will call create almost instant instant results and ultimately this is basically it. It has to go to well out the volume. Uh, this, this part is very optional and uh,
Hello. Welcome to one when you can use the sliders. On the, it doesn't have to be too close. You just have to sort of get a general idea. You can pair away um, things, extra things that you segment later. Um, and you'll notice that a sort of blue bubble is forming around the tumor we want to segment as we lay down more points. This one hardly took any points at all, but say you made a mistake, um, you can add another point to sort of expand the area a little bit, and that'll automatically change the bubble. Um, you know, say we make a really big mistake and accidentally click way over here, and you know, you think you've ruined the whole segmentation, but in that case, we can unselect the model marker placement tool, grab one of the points by holding down left click, and bring it back near all the other points and our segmentation will be pretty much the same. And we can use this to make I think we should explore a few solutions. Grammarly suggestions. Welcome to the segmentation. So if they're cut off by the edge of the volume, something like Gaussian distribution, say is after the segmentation, this threshold-based segmentation, uh, we have a threshold image, thresh image. Uh, in simple ITK, we have a trivial filter which is called label overlay. It takes an image, takes a, a structuring element, smaller uh, components, you, and that's the result. Now let's can't use this bacterium. So those. in this case 10 pixels away from the boundary we would like to keep that and those uh, and we use connected component to uh, get those and those will be seeds for our uh, watershed and again relabeling them is just uh,
using uh, for analyzing these are much is uh, numbered uh, uniquely and then afterwards we just run a watershed using the distance image and those uh, seeds as the seed points and uh, that's pretty much it and let's look at the data here this is how the uh, segmentation distance map looks so uh, that's that the watershed seeds we took this distance map and anything that was inside the object 10 pixels away from the border those would serve as seeds and we're highlighting those here these are these objects we can scroll through these volumes together just to see how they change you know uh, and finally this is the result of the watershed and this looks pretty good this is what we would like to be using uh, for analyzing the shape the bacteria shape they look to be well segmented even here when they're touching they're well segmented and but uh, what you should notice and I already iterated this several times is that bacteria to rechannel these unexpected profits. Prix de gaz. We support a European mechanism, which we ask from the European energy operators, whose production costs are far lower than market sales prices. And we will make sure that no such excessive profits can continue to be used by scheming them off in a way. Oil and gas companies have also made massive profits, and therefore we will propose that there is a solidarity contribution for fossil fuel companies. And we've used many, 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 many billions that we raise in the process to relieve the burden on citizens with an electricity price break. This is the approach that France supports and the approach that France and Germany support. It's the most coherent to fight against the disruption at the EU level. I am against a windfall tax. I believe it is the wrong thing to be, to be putting companies off investing in the United Kingdom just when we need to be growing the economy. European leaders are commenting on whether they believe the profits from energy companies should be subject to windfall taxes or rebranded, as Ursula von der Leyen just did, to a solidarity contribution. Interesting differential. Maria Tadeo is in Frankfurt for us. She's tracking the ECB today. Uh, we expect a rate hike. The question is just how big a rate hike can they do in the eye of an energy crisis? Maria, what's the current market position on that? Look, man, as the market was very well positioned to a 75 basis point, that was almost seen as consensus up until a few days ago. There is now debate precisely because of the energy story here. It's very difficult to separate at this stage the geopolitics from monetary policy, the economy, and the energy. Just the fact that today we're here in Frankfurt at the ECB, but tomorrow we'll be in Brussels monitoring the energy story, I think already tells you just how connected and intertwined these two have become. Now, the question is 75, 50. The 75 camp will tell you we have a window, and that window you have to hike decisively. This is a central uh, bank's credibility. Inflation now in some places in the euro area more than triples. That goal, this is a single mandate. You have to show your serious about bringing it back to target when you look at the 50 well they cite the energy story and they cite potentially that recession that may be to come if the worst case scenario a full rupture of gas supplies into the european union does materialize in the winter Maria, I mean, you mentioned just how prominent the energy discussion will be for this decision. I mean, you look here in the UK, for example, and, and we're seeing some form of coordination when it comes to what loosening that will bring. So what is tomorrow? What does the energy meeting mean for the ECB and I guess for the European economy as, the, as a whole? Yeah, 
and, and Danny, this is on everyone's minds. It will be on everyone's minds here in Frankfurt. It will be on everyone's minds in Brussels. And it already is when you look at the central bank, but also the commission, they speak using very similar terms. This is about the energy uh, crunch that we could see in Europe. Now, yesterday, I would point to the words of Ursula von der Leyen, who gave a very defined but also very important uh, speech. She said this is the end of Russia as an energy partner to the European Union. Some of the ideas floated tomorrow may include that gas uh, cap on Russian gas. She doubled down on that idea. She also talked about limiting profits for companies that produce energy, mostly electricity, but do not use gas. She also talked about demand destruction that may now become mandatory. We've been reported that it could be around a 10% demand destruction target for the EU as a whole. And then, of course, liquidity lines for European companies and margin calls. A lot of this will be a big debate, especially given the price fluctuations that we've seen in the market. Okay, Maria, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo, though, there. And we'll, of course, have comprehensive coverage of the ECB rate decision and Madame Lagarde's news conference today. That'll be 1.15 p.m. UK time. Stay with us for that. Now, in the UK, new Prime Minister Liz Truss is resisting calls to fund energy support with a windfall tax on companies. Truss was grilled on the policy during her Prime Minister's questions in Parliament yesterday. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. So, Lizzie, she seems to change her tune uh, a bit when it comes to windfall tax after the PMQs. What, what should our interpretation of that be? Yeah, I think we were all scratching our heads yesterday. So, at Prime Minister's questions, the opposition leader, Keir Starmer, went in on that Bloomberg scoop which showed that the energy company's excess profits because of the war in Ukraine mean that if the windfall tax were continued at its current rate, the Treasury could rake in tens of billions of pounds that could be used to fund policies like this. Uh, but later in the day, uh, Truss seemed to row back on her opposition to the windfall tax, so perhaps what she meant was she wouldn't be open to increasing it or extending it to include the power generators. But it does raise a number of political issues. Even some of her closest allies have warned that it was amateurish to be ruling out tax rises during the campaign. On top of that, a £200 billion package, as, Bloomberg's, as documents seen by Bloomberg suggest it's going to cost, looks an awful lot like a handout, which she, again, ruled out during the campaign. But on top of that, even with this package, people's energy bills could triple, uh, so it's still going to be painful. It, there's the question, will it be targeted enough? And also, what if this is the new normal? You know, if Putin does shut off the gas and this is a structural change, the other thing that Philip Hammond, the former chancellor, said to us on Bloomberg TV is the government cannot continue to so support Lizzie people through this. Lizzie, that, that, those numbers are, are interesting. The dispatch box was fascinating to watch between Starmer uh, and Truss as she was defending her tax cutting, grow the economy, roll of the dice that she's taking. But the energy bailout or intervention, the question for the Bank of England is, does it cap inflation? I'm seeing Barclays say it'll come down to 5%. Very quickly, um, how much would this cap cap inflation by? Well, according to Bloomberg economics analysis, it would mean that inflation's already peaked and a recession could be avoided. Of course, Andrew Bailey disagrees with that. He says that there would still be a recession. Uh, but the warning is that inflation is going to be controlled in the short term, but the risk of the economy overheating means that rates stay higher for longer. And Hugh Pill, the chief economist at the Bank of England, alluded to that yesterday by distinguishing between the short term and the long term inflation impact. OK, Lizzie, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden there. Man, it's a breaking line. The Japan Ministry of Finance, the BOJ, and the Financial Services Agency are going to hold a three-way meeting. The first since June, they'll be holding it at uh, 4.45 in, uh, in Japanese time. We are seeing some strengthening coming from the yen. Man, this might represent unilateral intervention. But, of course, the question will be, is that enough, or do they need more coordination? G2, from the likes we saw last time, the yen was at this level. Well, we've just had Viraj Patel with us. I'm very, very reluctant to commit to any kind of intervention. But this goes to the confluence of monetary policy uh, and, uh, you know, fiscal policy co-joining as you've just discussed there with Lizzie, which is, mm. you know, you're going to have number 11 Downing Street sitting down with Fred Needle Street, in other words, Bank of England and the Treasury yeah. uh, sitting down very, very regularly. So MOF, Ministry of Finance, Bank of Japan and FSA to hold a three-way meeting for the first time since June. So what's in there? By the way, the last time there was major intervention in size and scale was 1998, and that's when they interview, intervened and moved the market by six big figures. But of course, is that a game anybody wants to get into at the moment? There you go. There is a little bit of, little bit of a strengthening in mm. the yen and a drop in the dollar. So coming up, Danny, we're going to talk a little bit more about oil and uh, clawing back some of that 6% drop that it took on board yesterday. Uh, as Chengdu extends its lockdown, there is a relief in the Brent price this morning, 88.80. More on Bloomberg. everybody want to be a consultant and what are all these consultants doing well David I think that we actually defy the label consultant because sometimes consultant seems to imply that we only give advice and when you look at what Accenture does we're really different than the traditional version of a consultant we're really about relevance and results and that's what is uh, driving our business what about a consulting project in my example I'm the CEO I have a problem I call you up I say solve my problem or give me a solution we don't operate as big companies permanently in crisis mode and so when you think about what how long does it solve things a lot of it starts with you know the company being willing to set aggressive goals and so what we are trying to do now that is work with our clients to work differently and to work